So I'm very excited to welcome Professor Nancy Canwisher as our next speaker. She's a founding member of the McGovern Institute, as well as being the Walter A. Rosenblith Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience in Brain and Cognitive Sciences. She obtained her PhD here at MIT in Cognitive Psychology. She studies the functional organization of the human brain and has gained tremendous insight over the years into, into in using this approach um, as a window into the architecture of the mind. Um, she's played a central role in the identification of several dozen regions of the cortex in humans that are engaged in particular components of perception and cognition. And I'm very intrigued by her talk title, as I am with every talk title so far, <laughs> of, uh, which is Selective Responses to Music in the Human Brain. Dr. Nancy Camwish. Thanks, Sabi, and thanks to everyone for being here. This has been lovely to participate in this celebration of Pat's life and of the many uh, wonderful discoveries that have been made by the um, McGovern Institutes. And for me personally, it's been just a huge privilege and an honor to be a member of the McGovern Institute since, it's, since, it, since it began. A brief apology in advance. I'm coming off a really nasty cold, so pardon the unpleasant noises coming from my throat. Um, um, anyway, I will try not to de devolve into coughing fits. Um, what I want to talk about today um, is um, a seemingly fluffy topic uh, of music. But I want to assert that actually it's not a fluffy topic, it's actually a really fundamental one for understanding who we are as human beings. And we can see that in a number of ways. So first, uh, music is uniquely and universally um, a a human. So it's present in some form in every human society that's been uh, studied. Uh, and it differs substantially from its closest analogs in animals. Music is also extremely important to us humans. And you can see this, too, in all kinds of ways. One, we have been doing it for a long time. Um, you've probably heard of the bone flutes that have been found in caves in Europe that are 40,000 years old. Uh, and most people who think about this think that uh, actually music goes way back before that uh, in the form of singing. After all, you don't need to make anything to sing, so that probably happened before the bone flutes. Uh, music also arises very early in development. Um, in young infants are extremely interested in music, uh, and they're sensitive to beat and to melody, even melody abstracted away from absolute pitch, something even songbirds uh, can't do. Uh, and finally, people spend a lot of money on music. 43 billion in sales last year. Um, so these facts raise a very obvious question, and that is why, why do we do this? Why do humans create music and why do they like it? And what is up with that? So thinkers have been puzzling over this question for a very long time. Uh, and famously, Darwin um, said, as neither the enjoyment nor the capacity of producing musical notes and faculties are of the least direct use to man in reference to his ordinary habits of life, they must be ranked among the most mysterious with which he is endowed. Um, so indeed, it is a huge puzzle. Darwin seems to be assuming here that music is an evolved capacity, that is, something specifically shaped by natural selection. Um, but that's an important question. Is it an evolved capacity? And if so, what is that function that was selected for? Darwin's answer to that question, speculative but interesting, was that it was for sexual selection. He appears, it appears probable that the progenitors of man, either the males or females or both sexes, before acquiring the power of expressing their mutual love in articulate language, endeavored to charm each other with musical notes and rhythm. A note he says, he's, he's speculating that music arose before language. Like, very, very fundamental. Um, more modern theorists put forth all kinds of ideas. For example, a recent paper argues that music plays a role in managing parent-offspring conflict, that infant-directed song, that is lullaby, arose in an evolutionary arms race between parents and infants, stemming from the dynamics of conflict. Uh, and there are many other such stories. But note that these are just the stories that assume that music is an evolutionary adaptation. There's another possible argument that it's not an adaptation at all. In fact, Steve Pinker wrote quite a while ago that music is auditory cheesecake, an exquisite collection, a confection 
crafted to tickle the sensitive spots of at least six of our mental faculties. If it vanished from our species, the rest of our lifestyle would be virtually unchanged. That may say more about Steve Pinker than about music, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, what he's trying to say here is that it's possible music isn't uh, directly selected for in natural selection. It isn't an, uh, an adaptation itself, but some kind of alternate use of neural machinery that evolved for some other functions. The most obvious candidates being speech and language. And so now we realize, aha, now we have in all this idle speculation or hot air, we have an empirical hypothesis that we can test. Um, so does music actually recruit neural machinery for speech and language? Um, in, it, there's lots of reason to think it does. People have noted so many uh, commonalities between music and language. Not only are they both uniquely and distinctively human, but they both are auditory things that happen o over time, and they both have complex hierarchical structure. Syntax and language and some kind of analog has been hypothesized for music. And there have been many, many studies in the neuroimaging literature that have claimed overlap in the brain uh, when you understand sentences and listen to music. However, most of them have been doing group analyses where you take a bunch of subjects, align their brains, and get a really blurry picture of the average activation. And when you find overlap in activation in that kind of analysis, it's really not very telling because you might have no overlap at all in any individual subject. So really what you need to do uh, is do it right, look at individual subjects, and Ev Fedorenko has been doing that for a while. And so what she did in a study a few years ago is first identify language regions in each subject individually. So you scan them reading sentences and reading non-word strings, and you find in each subject the bits that respond, shown in red here in three different subjects, the bits that respond more when you understand a sentence than when you read a bunch of non-words. So that's just a standard way to identify in each subject the language regions. But now that you've identified them, you can say, okay, how, how much do these guys respond when you listen to music? And so she played things like this. Okay, well, it's not very loud, but anyway, more relevant is um, the scrambled version. It's kind of like a bunch of cats running along a piano keyboard. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Anyway, scrambled music. Um, and the finding is that none of these language regions respond at all in this contrast. In fact, they don't respond above baseline pretty much when you listen to music compared to staring at a dot and doing nothing. Um, and conversely, we can say, what if we use that same contrast, intact versus scrambled music, and we identify regions in the human brain that respond more, and there's some little bits in the anterior temporal lobe shown here. This is a, a dreaded group analysis just to show you where they are in general. Uh, but then we can find those regions in each subject individually and then ask whether those regions are engaged when you read a sentence, the opposite of what we did before. Uh, and here's the response of those regions when you read sentences in black and when you read a bunch of non-word strings in gray. And you can see they're just not interested. They don't respond differentially at all. So um, basically what we have here is a double dissociation. The bits of brain that, that respond when you understand the meaning of a sentence aren't interested in music, and the bits that respond to music aren't interested in sentence understanding. So in answer to this question, like, no, it's pretty damn clear that the neural machinery of language does not overlap with neural machinery for music. At least not the neural machinery for understanding high-level linguistic content, that is, understanding the meaning of a sentence, a very abstract um, endeavor. Um, which engages regions that are not tied to a modality. The same regions engage whether you hear a sentence or read the sentence. But what about mechanisms for speech perception? That's an auditory process. That's really quite different. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you might think that speech perception, this, this auditory machinery that you're all using right now when you listen to me, and when you can make all these fine-grained discriminations of very subtly different sounds and string them together to understand what I'm saying, maybe some of that stuff is involved, or maybe some other part of auditory cortex. When we started thinking about this, actually the organization of auditory cortex was not well understood. So Sam Norman Hegner and Josh McDermott and I decided to make a foray into auditory cortex. And we used a, a method which several of us have given talks about before, so I'm just going to summarize it in one slide. 
Um, and this is an unusual approach in that we didn't start with a hypothesis and go in and look for a particular distinctive response. Instead, we said, let's do a data-driven method. Let's scan people listening to lots of different kinds of sounds. So we broadly sampled the kinds of familiar sounds you hear in everyday life, a person speaking, a toilet flushing, liquid pouring, uh, a car accelerating, the basic sounds of everyday life. We put these on the web and we asked people how recently they heard this sound and we took the top 165 sounds, little two second sound clips. We then scanned people while they listened to these 165 different sounds and we measured the response of each voxel, each little three dimensional pixel in the uh, whole temporal lobe when people listen to these sounds. And that gave us a matrix like this. So that matrix um, shows the response of each voxel. Each voxel is a vertical stripe there uh, to each of the 165 sounds. And across 10 subjects, we had 10,000 voxels. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so then we do some math, which I will skip over here. It's a variant of independent component analysis that basically says, tell me the basic structure in this matrix. Factorize this matrix. Tell me, boil it down to its essence. And the nice thing about this analysis is it made no assumptions about the data whatsoever. The math didn't even know the labels on the data. It didn't know where the voxels were located or what the category, what the particular sounds were. Um, and so it's really very hypothesis neutral. Uh, and what came out of that was that six components explain 80% of the replicable variance in that matrix. So with just six kinds of responses, <coughs> we can recreate the pattern of data we collected. So what are those six responses? Uh, well, four of them respect, reflected more or less anticipated acoustic properties of sounds, things like selectivity for high frequencies or low frequencies. That's a well-known property of um, primary auditory cortex, uh, that it has, it's tonotopic, it has a, a frequency map. Uh, and we discovered a few other um, sort of established, not quite established, but not earth-shattering acoustic properties. But two of the components were nothing of the kind. Here's one of them, component five. This shows you the magnitude of response of component five across our 165 sounds. And if I show you the color code for the basic categories of sounds, we can then average within each category. And what you see is this component responds very strongly to English speech, but also importantly, it responds to foreign speech, which our subjects did not understand. It responds intermediately to vocal music and very low to everything else. So this is a response to speech sounds, importantly, not language meaning. The, the, the response is strong even when you have no idea what's being said, you just know it's speech. So, um, so that's a speech selective component. Um, it's not entirely new. A few uh, prior papers had alluded to this. Uh, but we have more, more um, stimulus conditions, so the evidence for selectivity here is stronger than in prior studies. But the really cool thing was component six. And here's component six. If we average within a category, you see that there's a very strong response to both instrumental music and vocal music, and a much lower response to everything else. And this really had not been seen before. Um, if we project these components back in the brain, we can see that the speech selective component lands right here. This is the top of the temporal lobe. The white and black bits are the tonotopic maps in primary auditory cortex. So just below primary auditory cortex is this band of speech selective cortex. Uh, and the music components have a little blob in the front and back uh, of auditory cortex, just above speech selective cortex. So this music selective stuff is really um, totally new. It shows a double dissociation of music and speech, very strong one. Um, and it tells us that music is not just co-opting mechanisms we already have for speech. They're completely different from each other. Okay, so when you see something this cool and surprising, your first reaction as a, as a scientist is, really? That was my reaction. Um, and so um, Dana Bobinger uh, and Sam and Josh and I have been setting out to first see if we can replicate this result. Um, so we scanned, we, I mean we, I mean Dana, scanned 20 new subjects. Um, and she also asked, while she was at it, whether that music component is a result of musical training. Because most people around here take years of lessons of one kind or another. 
Um, and so uh, and this, this question is kind of by analogy to a region known as the visual word form area, this little orange thing on the bottom surface of the brain, uh, which responds strongly and selectively when you look at words and letter strings. Okay, and it's known that that region is a direct result of explicit training. So here's some of our data. Here's the response of the visual word form area in eight-year-olds. In purple is the response to words, and you can see it responds more to words than lots of other things. But in this case, we scanned eight-year-olds who had been scanned a few years before in John Gabrielli's lab. And so we aligned the data, and we asked what those very same regions in each subject were doing when the kid was age five before they learned to read. And that very same re region was not selective for words or anything of the kind. And so that just shows what you might guess, which is you only have this region after you're taught to, to, to read. Okay, so the question here is whether music is like that, a result of training. So to find out, Dana scanned 10 subjects um, who have no musical training at all. They're hard to find around here, but eight of these 10 never had a one-on-one -on -one lesson, never participated in a high school band, and two of them had just minimal version of that. Uh, the least musical training we can find in otherwise normal people around here. Uh, ten were highly trained musicians, Berkeley students and people like that, who practice many hours a day and have done so for many, many years. Um, so uh, first we asked, so this is some of Sam's data. This is how we discovered that there were six components that account for the variance. We look at the variance accounted for as a function of the number of components we model, and you can see it kind of elbows after six in Sam's data. And here's Dana's data, it also elbows after six. So she also finds that six components account for 80% of the variance. But now what are those components? Are they similar to the ones that Sam saw? Well, yes they are. So here's the speech component here, showing a strong response um, to the two uh, different kinds of speech sounds, foreign and native. Um, and this, a similar um, distribution in the brain to what I showed you before. And here's the music component, showing a very strong response to all the different music conditions, including some new ones that Dana included in her condition, and a similar brain distribution uh, for that component as well. So yes, it replicates very strongly in the new set of subjects. But what about this difference? Um, what about the, the subject groups? Do we see this even in the subjects with no explicit musical training at all? Yes, we do. If you do the analysis on just those 10 subjects, you see a very nice mu select, music selective component um, shown right there. Uh, and it's not too different from the music selective component you get in the highly trained musicians. So that says that the music component is present in people with no explicit music training. Now, notice I say, uh, I didn't say this means no musical experience. It would be virtually impossible to find people with no musical experience who had normal hearing. Uh, so we're just saying here no explicit training. Uh, I do think that there may be a difference between the two groups. We're still analyzing the data every which way. And it seems that you can sort of see a hint of it here. The, that component may be a bit more selective in the highly trained musicians. Um, <coughs> but the pr uh, point for now is that it's present in both. Okay, so this has been a bit of a shaggy dog story, so let me t remind you where we've been. Uh, we've said that music perception does not engage cortical regions specialized for language understanding and vice versa. That data-driven methods um, discover uh, a strikingly um, music-specific component in human auditory cortex. Uh, that that music component doesn't respond to speech and vice versa. And it's present in people with no explicit musical training. Um, so it's not like the visual word form area in re the requirement for explicit training, though it's an open question whether it might be like the visual word form area in requiring some experience, some exposure uh, to music. So this is all nice, but what, it, what is this music component business anyway? That's kind of abstract and inferred. We sort of have been assuming that it refers to a population of neurons that have that response profile. But so far, we've inferred it mathematically. We haven't been able to see it directly. And in fact, when you look directly, you do not see it very strongly, presumably because these neural populations cohabit with other neural populations within voxels, which is how the math is enabled to pull them out. Uh, but for somebody like me, I like to see it in the raw data. So can we do that? Um, 
So we figured that perhaps with a higher resolution method, we might be able to see it. And the higher resolution method we used was intracranial recordings from electrodes directly on the surface of the human brain. And one has this opportunity very rarely in the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in the case of neurosurgery patients um, who have to have craniotomies for neurosurgery. Um, and very often the neurosurgeons will decide to put an array of electrodes right on the surface of the brain in order to map out the focus of the epilepsy and also to map out function so they can plan their surgical route. And when these patients are exceedingly kind, um, they say, yes, they'll be happy to listen to our silly stimuli while we record from their brains, and we're very grateful for that when they do. Uh, and so this took um, about four years to collect uh, data because it's very rare to find these people. So I'm going to show you data from 13 neurosurgery patients with arrays of electrodes over the temporal lobe over the superior temporal gyrus. So here are the 13 subjects showing you where the electrodes were located. Um, the 271 of those electrodes uh, responded uh, reliably to sound. That is, when we played the, that um, set of 165 sounds and we looked for a correlation across split halves of the data showing that the pattern of response across those sounds was replicable across repeated tests, those are the electrodes in red, the ones that we test further. And so we measure the high gamma response, which is a proxy for firing rate, uh, to those 165 sounds in each of these electrodes. When we do that, we find three different kinds of uh, electrode responses. And I'll be showing your data, uh, showing you those data in a second, but I want to note for the connoisseurs um, that the, um, these electrodes were chosen based on one set of data, and the data I'm showing you is an independent set of data, so we're not double dipping. Can't do that. Okay. Here's an example of the first kind of electrode. So what you're seeing, this is, a, this is a single electrode here. Time is going from left to right, and these are the 165 sounds vertically. Um, so across each uh, row is a magnitude of response. And so you see a band of responses right here. And if you look at the labels out here, you see, oh, that's native speech and foreign speech and a little bit of music with vocals. So, uh, and here's the, because this is intracranial recording, we now have nice time information and we can resolve the time response here and you see that at the bottom. So this is a speech selective electrode. Um, we found 192 of these. This is very nice, they've been characterized before. Um, um, and, but it's, it's, it's nice, in fact, thrilling to see them, even though they've been reported before because they're so damn selective and so particular. Um, but the real prize in this study was electrodes like this one over on the left. And if you look at where all the strong responses are, which you can see in a histogram on the right, um, all the strong responses are from music, instrumental and vocal music, right there. And so um, if you look, you can see, well, there's a couple um, sounds down here that produced a strong response. What are those? Well, if you look at what those are, they're whistling, humming, the computer j um, jingle, the thing that goes da 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 da, right? Uh, and the ringtone, the most common ringtone on a cell phone, all of which were labeled as not music by our subjects, but which we could give a pass and construe as not really evidence against the music story. Here's the time course of that response, very strong selective response, and it kicks in pretty fast after stimulus onset. Okay, and there wasn't just one music selective electrode, there were 14 of these. Here are five of them, and you can see a similar pattern of music selectivity and a variety of different kinds of time courses. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, it's fine. It's just what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah, thank you. So what does this mean? This means that music selectivity is for real. It's not just some thing that emerged from the math. It's actually there in the data. We can see it in the raw, raw gamma responses of individual electrodes, which you can't see with functional MRI. This also validates that method that Sam used in a really nice way. But beyond just validating the existence of selectivity for music, we found a real surprise that we didn't anticipate at all. And that is that in addition to speech and music selective responses, we also found song selective responses. Electrodes that respond not just selectively to music, but selectively to vocal music. We didn't predict this at all. Here's one right here. You can see it with this band of response to
to vocal music, shown in pink ears of vocal music. Very strong response. Um, and again, it wasn't just one. There were um, eight electrodes that showed here along the bottom here uh, the selectivity for vocal music. And that was pretty astonishing. Further, the selectivity for vocal music can't be accounted for as just a linear sum of responses to speech and responses to instrumental music. It's super additive, and if you do the careful math, we can show that it's significantly higher than the sum of those two. So it's its own special thing. So um, an important question, I'm, I haven't been tracking time. Am I almost out or I have been? Okay, good. Okay, so, um, so an important question I haven't really grappled with yet is whether these responses can be accounted for in terms of acoustic properties. It seems unlikely because of the just sheer heterogeneity of the music samples. Nonetheless, we need to take this seriously. And luckily, I have collaborators who invented a great method for doing this. So in a paper that Sam and Josh uh, published just a few months ago, they developed um, a really wonderful method where the idea is you take your original sound stimulus and then with a bunch of fancy algorithms we'll leave out, you generate an alternate paired version of it that's kind of matched for acoustic properties um, in terms of a, a standard model of primary auditory cortex. It's a bank of linear spectrotemple fil filters. And so you make that model match stimulus uh, and when they do that, you can see that here's a, um, the spectrogram um, with frequency on the uh, y-axis and time on the x-axis of a woman speaking here. And here's the model match sound. You can see that it's really matched the spectrogram very nicely, and yet this is all their data. I'm just using their method. I don't want to get credit for stuff I don't deserve. But just to show you how awesome this method is, even though these spectrograms look so similar, they sound very different. So here's the original sound. It offers a time warp let me do it again. Is that art offers a time warp? Okay, just a little sample of speech. Here's a model match version. You can sort of tell it's speech, but you certainly can't tell what's being said, and it's not right at all. Let's listen to the violin. Okay, here's a model match version. <laughs> it sounds like a bunch of sea lions. <laughs> okay. So um, indeed, in, in beautiful studies that Sam and Josh and Alex Kell have done, when you scan subjects listening to these, you find that primary auditory cortex responds exactly the same to the original and the model match version, right? But higher level cortex does not, okay? So, um, so then we can use, we, we play these sounds to the patients who have the intracranial electrodes. Uh, and we can ask whether the acoustics can account for it. And so here's how to, um, Look at this. So here is um, two different electrodes that respond, <coughs> excuse me, selectively to music, both instrumental in blue and vocal uh, music in pink. And so this shows you uh, test retest reliability. So the x-axis is each dot is a different sound. Um, the x-axis is one presentation, and the y-axis is another. And you can see it's highly replicable that these music and um, and uh, vocal music selective uh, uh, responses. Or replicate across repeated tests in both of these electrodes. But what I'm going to show you next is a similar graph where one, where the y-axis is now showing you the response to the synthetic version. And you can see in this case that all of those responses drop. In other words, you don't get the same response in a music selective electrode when you show them, when you play the model matched version, even though acoustically it's tightly matched. Okay. Um, so uh, that shows that it's not the acoustics that are driving the music selective response. And when you do that with the song selective electrodes, here's just showing you test retest reliability of two of the song selective electrodes. And here's what you see with the model match thing. Again, the responses to the model match versions drop a great deal, showing you that the acoustics alone are not driving this. Okay, so. Um, so no, acoustics can't account, acoustic, low level acoustic properties can't account for these selectivities. Okay, so to conclude, these are the points I did in the inter interim summary, I'm not gonna repeat them. The new points since then are that the music selective component inferred from functional MRI has now been validated by direct recording from the surface of the human brain. No math, no nothing. Um, second, we find a new neural selectivity for vocal music. Um, these selectivities can't be accounted for by acoustic properties. Um, and so that's where we are right now. 
And I think that's cool and awesome. But it raises a huge number of questions. I'm sure there, many of these are already in your own heads. The ones that are most urgent for us are to figure out what it is about music that's driving these responses. Is it rhythms? Is it melodies? Is it something simpler, like the presence of a note or an interval or a beat? Um, yeah, further, we want to know, how do you actually code for a piece of music and a bunch of neurons, right? So far, we've discovered two populations of neurons. Uh, that surely is not enough. What is the actual neural code for music? Um, third, how do song and um, music selectivity arise over development? Are they present at birth? Do they arise soon thereafter? Do they arise much later, like the visual word form area? Oh, whoops. Um, and of course, the question I started with, how much of this, if any, uh, is a product of natural selection? And I'll stop there and take questions. Questions for Nancy? Nancy. <coughs> Me too. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, try, I'm trying hard to talk. Nancy, you, your measurement was high gamma, fabulous results. Have you looked at other frequencies? Is it only high gamma? Oh, great question. We've only looked at the high gamma so far. Uh -huh. Typically, when you see this kind of selective response for uh, language stuff, which we've published a couple of years ago, um, and for, you know, face and color preferring regions in the ventral pathway, you see it the, the primarily in high gamma. And here, just to follow and that's up. And that's the standard finding of people who are doing intracranial recording studies. Right. And, and, and when, when people have looked, other studies, not mine, have looked at um, uh, these kinds of recording where you also have the opportunity to measure um, unit activity, and the high gamma is most strongly correlated with firing rate. And have you ever seen inhibition of one component versus excitation of another? Um, so, do you mean, do we ever see like a negative response to some yeah. of the stimuli? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important question. I skipped over a lot of the details on the, um, the component method, but because that matrix, factorizing a matrix is, is an ill-posed problem. So you need to make some assumptions. And one of the assumptions we made with the functional MRI stuff, which you can test independently, so it's not like completely on thin ice, uh, but one of the assumptions um, was non-negative responses. And in fact, that really does fit the data pretty well. With the intracranial data, um, it's also very clearly non-negative. Um, so, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely fascinating talk. I want to go uh, back to that evolutionary question that you started and ended with. Um, just because the areas are non-overlapping today, is that evidence that it did not arise as a single area. And in particular, evolutionarily, one could paint a very nice picture of sexual <coughs> selection for dance and movement coordination, which are uh, indicative of being able to hunt, being able to do all kinds of other things, which eventually becomes a sexually selective trait by itself, which then leads to drumming, dancing, you know, vocalization, and ultimately, you know, language. So uh, my question is, are there other examples of uh, areas that in primates, for example, are combined, but then have separated away in the human brain that would suggest that perhaps similar things may have been evolved here and early in the evolution, you know, w that, that theory may not actually be disprovable with modern day data? Yeah, it's a super interesting question. Um, of course it's possible that they used to overlap. There used to be one function and it differentiated. And how we would ever get evidence for that, I have no idea. Um, as for the primate data, um, <laughs> sorry, um, I can't wait uh, to look at data like this in macaques. My strong hypothesis is we won't see anything like the speech or music uh, selective responses. I certainly hope we won't. Um, if we do, then our interpretation just isn't right. It's like some other thing, right? Um, we have done with uh, functional MRI, this is mostly Bevel Conway and Sam Norman Hegner, um, I was just along for the ride, um, what I think is a super interesting study in macaques. So a whole other part of this work that I didn't talk about is separate from the music selective responses, 
uh, Sam and Josh and I had originally reported pitch selective responses. And those are different from the music selective responses. They're dissociable uh, in the brain. Um, and in monkeys, you pretty much don't see the pitch selective response. And in fact, I would go further to say that I think all of auditory cortex is just going to be profoundly different in macaques. Unlike visual cortex, which is extremely homologous between humans and macaques, I think you know, we use vision in very similar ways to monkeys, but we use audition in very different ways, namely for speech and music. Just to separate nature and nurture, I'm curious about the tribes that uh, Josh hangs out with. Uh, if you have tried any of the music selective, self selective aspects. Wouldn't that be fun? I've thought a lot about it, but I, you know, I, I should talk to Josh about this. Every time I think about that, I just think like the ethics of bringing some of those people up here to scan them, it's really dicey. I don't know. But okay. boy. Mm, that's hard too. Yeah, it's 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 not easy. But I agree. It's a super interesting question. Thank you so much.